Good evening and welcome to Knox Mente. Tonight's guest is Mike Williams, host of the Sage Quay Radio Hour. Mike is a critical thinker and the host of the popular internet radio show, The Sage of Quay Radio Hour. He's also the founder of the alternative news blog, Sage of Quay Radio. Mike's radio show and blog is dedicated to awakening the masses and bringing humanity back into our natural existence of living in truth and serving creation. Mike brings his audience information on alternative news, alternative research, conspiracy, holistic healing, the esoteric, spirituality, and much, much more. Mike and his guests are real people with real knowledge on topics and issues you need to know about. Mike, welcome to Knoxman. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Nish. Hello, Mike. This is going to be a good one. In our pre-chat here, everyone, we were just talking with Mike about, he's a hypnotherapist for eight years, you said? Yes. So that's going to be juicy in our little conversation about all this states of consciousness. Can't wait. All right. So how's your day been? Just... Since we have some chit chat, let's let the chat in on it. It's been a very good day. I actually got back around eight o'clock and that's why I was on early. Jerry, you said I was uh, arrived early here for the show. It's because I got into my office here and uh, I was working on some stuff and I figured, let me just connect so I don't forget or come in late. I'm, and so I'm it's been a good day. Pretty sure you're the first person who ever beat me to Zoom. <laughs> Excellent. Where are you located, Mike? I'm in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Okay, you're not far from Jerry. Not at all. I'm in Atlanta, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not far at all. I'm on the other coast in Washington. Oh, okay. Haha. <laughs> Which I love, by the way. Um, all right, cool. Let's get started. So tell us, give us an idea of the earliest part of your life that sticks out, the stuff that um you know like did you play in the woods did you watch cartoons what cartoons give us a little idea of young mike developing i had a very good childhood my father was a new york city police officer and mom stayed at home you know she took care of the kids there's four of us there's uh three boys and one girl and my early days, I was um, on Long Island in New York, had a lot of friends, and it was a very blue collar area. And we did spend a lot of time in the woods and uh, playing around on the golf course that was at the end of our street. I mean, it wasn't in one of these highfalutin golf courses, but uh, we would play there and we would get chased a lot off of the golf course. Uh, let me see, we played a lot of sports so i played a lot of uh baseball and basketball and football with no equipment <laughs> um, that's old school <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> with the playgrounds they had metal like, play like stuff daily swims in the bronx river like george carlin right? <laughs> jerry's also from new york by the way yes yes jerry was telling me before the show and um bike riding and uh and, and just stuff like that it was a very different time i can tell you today Everything is uh, almost on lockdown with kids with what they can do and being supervised and being kept in the house and all that stuff. You know, back in my day, I'm going to be 60 years old in January. So back when I was a kid, it was just very free flowing as a child. And my parents never worried about, you know, where we were. We were out with friends and we would come home for dinner and, you know, and we had a very safe neighborhood. And everybody looked out for each other. That was a very community-oriented type of growing up that I had. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, the world's, I'm not, I, I'm in my 40s, but the world from my life is just dramatically different with the neighborhood. So we all knew each other. People actually yelled, <laughs> yelled for their kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, time to eat, you'd hear that from some people. Too funny to think about. But right. yeah, I mean, we ate dirt. You know, imagine that these days. Snow <laughs> forts. Know, imagine snow forts these days. <laughs> yeah, all of it. I was thinking too, a lot of those rules, the safety rules are transcended to adults too. I mean, there are townships and places around Atlanta where you cannot ride as an adult without a helmet. You'll get a ticket. Right. Yeah, it's, a it's, bike, um, a bike, not a motorcycle, a bike. Yeah. A bike, yeah. that's right. Well, we didn't have seatbelts. The seatbelt law wasn't around when I was young. <laughs> My parents told yes. me when, when we moved from New York to Chicago, that we drove a station wagon across, uh, whatever it was, I-95, and I stood up the whole way in the back, they said. 
<laughs> we just let you, you were <laughs> happy to stand them. there. <laughs> what kind of uh, media stuff did you enjoy, Mike, when you were young? As a kid, the cartoons that I remember liking to watch, I loved uh, superheroes. So I loved like watching Superman and even the, not the, the cartoon, but with George Reeves. Oh, yeah. Um, the old Superman yeah. show. Um, I remember watching um, Tom and Jerry, Popeye. I mean, the whole suite of shows that were very popular uh, cartoons when I was a kid. And I remember waking up Saturday morning because you said the whole suite of cartoons Saturday mornings when I was a kid. And I would yes. watch that until my, my father came down and said, you know, go outside. My father did not like us being in the house. He felt <laughs> <laughs> Kids need to be outside. So we reached yes. a certain point Saturday morning. He kicked us out, you know. So it was shows like that. That's awesome. Man, you're bringing back some memories for me, too, that we always got kicked out. And the looking forward to Saturday cartoons yeah. all week long, all week long. It was just such an event. Now, you know, they're on all the time. It's a constant, I think. Yes. And that's playing into some of this everything now stuff that's happening. It starts just right there. It's a baby. Yes, that's right. So today you have a constant stream of it. Like they have the Cartoon Network as an example, right? And, and by the way, I'm probably going to show my age, but a lot of the cartoons that they're showing, uh, especially on the Cartoon Network, are uh, not appropriate for young kids. Yet they're on when young kids are, are going to watch that stuff. So uh, back in the mm -hmm. day, you know, the cartoons that we had, it was very different. It, it just is very, very different. It was, it's, it's actually dramatically different if you do a side-by-side -side view now of just cartoon content. It's, it's dramatic. Yes. Um, okay, excellent. Um, also, in this early period of your life, do you, were you a dreaming boy? Do you remember dreaming? I remember dreaming. I've, I've always had dreams. But trying to remember like early dreams, I don't really remember what I would dream about. Like I didn't have recurring dreams. And in fact, to this day, I don't really have recurring dreams. What I have had ever since I was very young and still have to this day is sleep paralysis. Ooh, I want to talk about that a little bit later in. Okay, yeah. That's, um, we haven't had any good sleep paralysis stuff in a minute, in a few shows. Uh, um, so, and that stuff stems way back to your childhood? Yeah, my whole life. In interesting. And so, and then still back in your early life, did you have any fears? Like were there, you know, like the under the bed thing, the closet, the dark woods? Yes. I remember as a kid, very young, having a certain level of fear uh, at night. And I would often sleep with a nightlight in order mm. to offset that, that fear. And, and as long as it was just you know, just even a nightlight in the room, I was fine. And I'm not even really sure what it was that I was fearful of. Um, but I just, as a kid, a very young kid, I did have a fear of the dark. Yeah, it's amazing the power of the nightlight. Seriously, I went through a phase where I couldn't, I had to have it on. It was, it was unbearable without it. Um, okay, cool. Let's move in a little bit to... So we kind of we have like kind of where you where you grew up and and these kinds of fun things. So what about when you got a little bit older and you started actually? What's your earliest dream at this point in the conversation that you actually can get a grasp of and remember? My earliest dream that I can grasp. Boy, oh boy, that's a tough question. You know, I really don't. Don't know. I had plenty of dreams, but I can't say there was one that stood out that I can recall going back to when I was a kid. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to add anything here. <laughs> no, that's all right. I kind of just seed you with that. And sometimes they, they do come up later. Yeah. So, and then, okay. So if we look at your life from kind of where you started and where you are now, has the dreamscape, the architecture of the dream, and the way you dream, has that changed at all? Yes. As time went on, especially even today, my dreams became more lucid. Mm. Uh, there are times when I dream and I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, it's really traveling, astral traveling. So 
I will wind up places um, where it's very lucid and I can actually navigate within the dream. So it's one of those things where once you become aware that you're having a dream, I used to hear this, right, with lucid dreams. Well, if you become aware that you're in the dream, you can actually navigate it. And I was never really able to do that. But over the last several years or so, I have been. And it makes for a very, very interesting dream because of all of the interaction. Do you remember that first time you kind of went lucid, as in you realized you were dreaming? The, yes, or it was a time when I had this dream and it was in the future. It was like a future city. And I remember I was walking along a sidewalk and it was very real. I mean, I can feel the air, I can hear everything. It was as if we're here right now, three dimensional, mm -hmm. right? But then I remember taking a look at the cityscape and seeing that, oh, okay, this doesn't look very much like a city as we would see it today. And then I saw some craft in the sky and, it, you know, they were obviously flying, but they weren't airplanes. You know, they were kind of a uh, more of a, uh, like shuttle types of uh, vehicles that I was seeing. And I remember um, that there was a man who was, they still had manhole covers, believe it or not. And I walked by one and this, there was a guy in the manhole cover and he was very angry. He was upset about something. And I remember laughing to myself because at this point I had realized that I was in this dream, it was lucid, and I was actually able to navigate it. And I started chuckling because I thought to myself, boy, you know, even though this is in the future, not much has changed because there was a whole bunch of four letter words coming out of his mouth <laughs> in that manhole cover. And I remember just walking the, the sidewalk. And I wasn't interacting with anybody directly, but I was able to see the interaction around me. And it was very, very real. What, how long, what time period was this for you? How old about? Uh, actually, I would say that uh, the actual having the ability to navigate in lucid dreams was probably about a decade ago, 10 years ago. So it wasn't very, very long ago, but it was about a decade ago where I had this ability to, to be able to you know, to interact in the dream. Excellent. When in, so I want to kind of parse this out now, since you, you already brought it up, you mentioned astral. So when you are, um, what's your concept here is everyone has a different kind of everyone. There's so many ways to unpack or even wrap up the concept of lucidity within dreams. Mm -hmm. And so, um, are there differences? Is astral traveling different to you than like, say, a high state of lucidity? Um, that's a very good question, too. I would say off the top of my head that they're probably different, but they have a, a, a similar construct, uh, if that makes sense. In other words, they share commonality, aspects of commonality, but I don't really know. That's a very good question, and I'm not sure. I can make it a clear distinction, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. For me, I, I have a hard time too. There is a sense of a differentness, but I, I've just yes. now come to, it's all like late states of lucidity because I don't really know what the hard lines are. It's an so, altered state. Well, that's what it is. You're in an altered state. So that's the common aspect of it that I guess I was referring to. Yes. Right. But where you end up, that's different. Destination. Right. The destination, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this ties into the hypnosis too, because you were explaining how that hypnotic state is also akin to that lucid state or that dream state or pre-dream yeah. state. Yeah, so what happens when you go into trance is you're slowing down the brain waves and the slowing down of the brain waves is what expands the consciousness. So that's, what, that's how you go into an altered state of consciousness. So beta is your waking state, then you drop into alpha, then you drop into theta. So as a hypotherapist, especially if you're doing spiritual regression, you want your clients in very deep theta state. And then the last state is delta. That would be sleep. There is a lot of similarities between the experience that you have in hypnosis and the dream state. There's a lot of similarities. Because it's the inner mind, and some people will, will refer to it as the unconscious or the subconscious mind, but I refer to it as the inner mind, loves imagination. It's the language of the inner mind. 
And so that's really what you have too when you're in your dream state, your mind, your brain shifts over to the right side. That's where all your creativity and imagination is. Um, so as a practitioner, when I work with hypnosis, whether it be clinical sessions or whether it be the spiritual sessions, I get a lot of insight into how the mind constructs and puts things together. The mind loves metaphors. It loves imagination. So um, hopefully that adds a little something here. Mm, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, that was that was excellent. With so with that, let's just riff off that. So with this idea of um, states of consciousness through that we see also with hypnosis, does does it shift the idea of time? How do you see time in all of this in these altered states of consciousness? Well, it's not like time here. I mean, time in three D is linear time, as as you guys know. Now, I'll give you an example. And maybe this will help the audience to to kind of understand uh, that time is time is is fluid. It's not most people are used to the linear time. So you know it's twelve o'clock, it's one o'clock, it's an hour later, two hours later, and so on. But when you go into a trance state, there is what we refer to as time distortion. So I can have a client in a past life regression that will run two to two and a half hours. The typical session runs two to two and a half hours. When they come out of that session, I will ask them, how long did you think that you were in trance? And they will say, oh, a half an hour. But it was two and a half hours. So that's the time distortion piece of it. Time is one of those things that I believe is really um, is a construct and a parameter of the, the realm in which we've incarnated into. It's, it's part of this domain that we decided to come into and interact with and, and to learn from. Outside of this domain, there may be no time. And you'll hear a lot of people who do metaphysical work and say that you know, it's, there's only now time. I, I don't know whether it's just now time. I don't know if it's time distortion. In other words, time slows down. I don't know. But I, I can tell you that through my work that the mind can and will view time or experience time differently. So it's very different in a trance state than it is in your waking state. And I find that to be very, very interesting. Indeed. And it's, um, if, if for me with all this stuff, everything is on the table. There's, um, these ideas are accessible to everyone when we're talking about stuff on this level with time. And especially when we're talking about when our consciousnesses shift out of this here and now waking life experience, right? I mean, right. there's it's a whole different experience. So just to to get a, the fundamentals out of the way here, when you're dreaming, what does the dream architecture look like for you? Black and white, color, you know, all that. The textures, sound. I get color. I, I never understood that uh, remember, remember we used to be taught that you only dream in black and white. Remember that? Yes, I right? never understood it's a total that. Total lie. I never understood that because I thought to myself, I don't, I dream in color. So I get color and uh, it's not black and white. I, in fact, I don't remember ever dreaming in black and white. Some of my dreams are, can be very abstract. Uh, and then I have to think about what was going on there I have a dream dictionary, by the way, so I'll take out my dream dictionary to uh, help to decode or interpret what the dream possibly meant, because a lot of times it is, uh, there are metaphors that are at play. And then there are times when, like I said, I have these very lucid dreams where there's extreme detail. It's, it's detail like I'm sitting here at my desk right now talking to you guys, and everything is uh, as real as it is right here. So it's, it's very varied, I would say, Ishai. I can't say there's like one particular type of uh, way that the dreams come to me. Is there a familiar, um, so this time when I say architecture, I mean actual architecture now. Like, is there a familiar house to you or landscapes that you return to? Uh, and they may shift, of course, because everything shifts, but you know them. Not really. I can't say that there is a consistent type of architecture that I constantly go back to, or it, 
like a recurring dream, I guess, right? You keep going back to the same thing. But uh, not necessarily recurring dreams. So like, for example, there, I have a house in uh -huh. dreamland somewhere and it shifts. It's always different. And, and it has nothing to do with any of the dramas that are playing out but i i always can i can find myself in it and um and and it's there and it's familiar even though it's shifted so do you see uh, the difference there yes yes I, I see the difference so from a dream perspective i can't say that i have a particular place that i go to uh, i can tell you that when i'm in a trance state i do so, and I do equate the, the dream state and the trance state to be very similar. But when I'm in a trance state, yes, I do wind up on another plane of existence. And uh, there are times when I, I refer to it as the spirit world, where I end up in a place that's very beautiful. And there's a large, large building roman with the columns there's a dome top and uh i've been there a few times and it's, it's a place where there are other souls and it's it's referred to uh well it has a, a part of it that is the learning center there's another part of it that is a, a healing center and this is other areas that the souls can spend their time researching learning healing and so on. So I've I've ended up in that place a number of times. Since you you mentioned this here within the trance realm, do you encounter in say the dream state um, other souls? So it's not just you. Yes, yes, other souls. Yes. Yeah. Are you referring to interacting with uh, with beings or people that you do not recognize in in your current life or the life that you, you're here living? But in the dream state, these people, you're interacting with them? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, but it can also be people you've known that have passed. And, and oh, I yeah. think the distinction here is that it's the, they're pushing back. They're not part of your internal um, network of imagery. They're actually autonomous entities. Yes. So uh, in other words, a relative has passed. And then I, when I go into the dream state, I'm experiencing them being with me and, and interacting with them? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, okay, yes. I have that actually uh, quite often where family members have passed away and uh, I will actually wind up with them. In fact, I had one recently. My, my uncle passed away about four years ago and about a year after he passed away, I was, uh, I was dreaming. And it was as real as real can be. And I was in a restaurant with him and he was sitting to my left. And, uh, and he looked, you know, he looked healthy and, uh, and younger. And he said to me, Michael, so how's everything going? And we were having this conversation. And then I remember him saying to me, uh, after we talked for a while, it was really good to see him. It was really, really an unbelievable visit. And um, he said to me, I have to go now. And I said, no, you know, stick around a little bit longer. You know, you don't have to go yet. He goes, no, really, I have to go. He says, but it was great seeing you again. And that's just one example. I've, I've had that plenty of times. And, um, you know, I refer to them as visits with uh, loved ones who have passed. Have you had, have you had a, a visit before you knew they were dying or died, or, um, like in the process of them passing? So you didn't know yet. And yet they, they showed up in the dream. That happened to me once where my Uncle John hadn't passed away yet, but he was old. What happened was I was in the dream and there were other family members that crossed over, had passed, and they were there. And uh, I was talking with them and uh, they were having a conversation with me about my father. It was his side of the family. My father's still alive. And I saw one of my aunts. Uh, she passed away, but her husband John was is still was still alive at the time. He's he, he's passed now, and I saw his body, but they wouldn't show me his face. And what I've learned is that when that happens, that means that they're almost there. And when they actually do cross over, then 
the face and everything else will will materialize. So that was one memory I have where um, my it was my aunt Sarah and I was I saw her there and then behind her was my uncle John. I knew it was him. That was the thing. I knew it was him, but I couldn't see his face, but I could see his body. And then I think it was maybe two years later he passed away. That is deeply fascinating to me about um, that process of not seeing the face until after they pass. Yeah, well, that's how it, it played out for me. Others might have different experiences, but that, that's how it was shown to me. Well, it makes so much sense considering the face is so much is tied up in that persona of the face, right? Yeah. That's how we recognize people, really. That's, um, I'm, I'm loving that. I've got that marked down in a special spot here, Mike. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's the first I've heard, and it makes so much sense. Just meaning your other stuff's going in a memory hole. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Jerry. Jerry recently. Um, okay, so that <laughs> just sidetracked me. Um, all right, so back to back to the the nuts and bolts of all this. So, in in the dream state, when you're dreaming, do you encounter? situations or experiences where you feel like you've gotten a download of information? Uh, yes. Yes. That's happened uh, a number of times. Actually had experiences where I'm actually ascending at very rapid rates of speed and going through uh, basically uh, an energetic field. I actually can feel my my physical body vibrating at a very high level of vibration, and then you know getting information, but basically information that would help me to reconcile maybe, as an example, issues that were going on in my life, or maybe I was going through a certain period where there were challenges um, that I was trying to work through, and getting reassurances that it's okay, it, it's it's okay. You're going to be all right. Just work through it, push through it. You know, if there's fear, push through the fear, and it's going to be okay. So, yeah, I have uh, I have experiences like that when I'm dreaming. It does happen periodically. Do you? Um, so on on this too. Have you also kind of in the same vein vein of this? Have you learned something within the parameters of the dreamscape? that you did not know in your waking life, but perhaps were interested in. So it's already there, obviously, in your mind, or maybe even not. But have you learned something in the dreamscape that, that was totally new to you? So, or at least sparked um, or filled in the blanks? Uh, so like when going to school, you know, like yeah. um, you're learning a new subject and in the dream, if the dream, will, you'll actually get the download. Well, I, mean, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question properly, but I, I guess what I've learned about it is that, well, let me start this way. We used to be taught that our dreams were nonsense, at least when I was a kid, you know, ah, dreaming's just, there's nothing to it. It's just nonsense. It's just what your mind does at night. And, you know, and then as I got older and I had more and more experiences, and, and let me just say this. When, when I was younger, I had a lot of paranormal experiences in my life. So I'll just, I'll, I'll just leave that there. Uh, we want to get into some of those later. just leave okay, that yeah, there. We, <laughs> well, the reason why, oh, the reason why I said that I, I, I know we can go off on a completely other, you know. A new yeah, I know. <laughs> but what happened was, what I mean by that was, I'm being told that dreams don't really mean anything. It's just the way your mind works at night and so on. And then I had a lot of paranormal experiences as a kid. And I knew that there was something a lot more to our existence than I was ever being told. But I, I just, but I just really wasn't sure what it was because, you know, when you have these paranormal experiences as a kid, uh, you really don't know what to do with them. And then as I got older, uh, I, I began to realize that dreams were not nonsense. That dreams meant something, and dreams were uh, a way for our mind to, it's like a clearinghouse to try to reconcile things and put things in the right place and, and, and so on, but also a way in which we would experience a, a state of consciousness that we just don't experience in, in the 3D world. 
what some people might consider to be abstract, and, and let's face it, a lot of times dreams are abstract, they actually do mean something. And that's why what I would do is like I have a dream dictionary and I'd have to try to remember the dream and uh, take a look and, and uh, understand what it is it was trying to tell me or show me or make me aware of. So what I've noticed with dreams is that there will be key symbols uh, shown to you. You know, as an example, you might in the dream, the clock might be spinning backwards very quickly, or you might be in a rowboat and the water is very calm, or you might be in a boat where the water is very rough. And so you would have to, or I would have to go back and say, okay, well, what did the backwards spinning clock mean? What did the boat in the very calm water mean? What does it mean when I saw the sunrise, as an example? So I know it's been a little long-winded here, but what I came to realize with the, the dreamscape, as you're referring to it as, um, I, I, I came to realize that it's really a part of our existence. It's really an aspect of us where we should pay attention to it because there is a, uh, a level of awareness that is trying to be brought to us to help enrich the experience we have here in the physical world, right? Because we have this physical aspect of this existence, but we also have the non-physical piece of it. And I, and I try to take my audience through this on a number of shows. That non-physical piece of it, that's where the dreams they, they play into that that piece of it. So I hope that made sense. Uh, I don't know if I made sense, but. No, that was that was great. And there's no such thing as long-winded here. We love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are hard concepts. I wanted to ask um, you, you brought up something, and I, I usually like to get this in the earlier sections of um, interaction, is what, were you brought up religious at all? I was, uh, my family, was Roman Catholic. My mother, more than my father, my father, he, you know, he wanted to go to church every Sunday. My mother was more into it. But I remember at a very young age, not liking church at all, not liking the whole, the ritual aspect of it. I thought it was creepy. And I, I just didn't like it. And I remember as soon as uh, I was able to drive and I turned 17, that. Um, I, I just stopped going. I just stopped going to church. But I was basically, you could say that my, my mother and my father tried to raise me as a Roman Catholic and it didn't work out. The, where are you now with um, religion, spirituality, that kind of stuff? I have no connection to any institutionalized religion, very spiritual. And you know that's why I do the work that I do with the spiritual regression. Reincarnation is real. I know there's going to be people listening to this that are going to be screaming at me right now. But look, with the work that I do, Nish and, and Jerry, it's real. We come back and we play different roles and we learn lessons. And that's what this is all about. We come back into this realm because it's a school. It's a school of higher education. And souls come here because Earth is extremely challenging. It's a very, very tough school. But the upside of it is, is that the soul's development and learning, it's faster because you're going to a tough school. It's, and, like, it's uh, like AP school, AP classes. Yes, yes. And then so you, you progress. You, you progress faster by going to this very, very challenging place. So that's, uh, that's my, my spirituality. Uh, it's reincarnation. And um, you come here to learn lessons and with the sole purpose of the soul uh, developing its knowledge and its wisdom, and ultimately its unconditional love, and to reconnect back to source. That is our goal. And uh, the Creator has decided, or God has decided, that this is the process that we have to go through in which to achieve that end result. And uh, and that's why you know we come here and other places to do what we do and to learn. Excellent. And so with this, let's circle around. Um, reincarnation for a minute in context to dreams so is it possible that i highly suspect reincarnation is i i have a f deep feeling of it too mike i just want to throw that out there okay um no one's ever come on here and said it's not there's no such thing as reincarnation 
Yeah, our audience tends to be the there, way. but we're talking about all this kind of stuff, and it seems like people that will get into this kind of flow with that. Sure, sure, but, but I'm just saying we've never really had anyone on who disagrees with that concept. Yeah, true. So with with reincarnation and dreams, is it is there a way? I guess I'm asking you this as a hypnotist, also as a a a, a prolific dreamer, and um, someone who investigates this kind of stuff. Can we see bits and pieces of other lives in our dream experience? How does that play out? Yes, yes. So I'll, let me. I'll give you a story, a real story. Um, I had a client come in and um, she came in for a past life regression and uh, she had a great session. In that past life session, she was uh, a young girl, maybe 14, 15 years old. She went through the, uh, the entire past life and then we wrapped up. You know, she has the life review with her guide and then I, I emerged her. And uh, so then we, after the session, concludes, uh, we just take a little time so that the client grounds before they head out and we chit chat, we talk a little bit. She said to me, you know, Mike, that girl that I was in that past life, she is a recurring dream that I have. So in this life, she would have a recurring dream. It was like a loop of this of this girl, but in this life, before she had the past life regression, now I didn't know any of this before the session. So we discussed this after the session, not before the session. So she would get this loop as a recurring dream. And then she went into the past life. And then she realized, became very aware that the little girl was her. So there was an imprint. There was a past life imprint that was running in her current life. And the interesting thing is, now in that life, what happened was she, she was killed in that life at a very young age. So you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with the, uh, with, with the looping or the imprint in this current life. But what happened was after the session, you know, she went home and then uh, she kept in touch with me. And I asked her, do you still have the recurring dream? And she said, no. And she had had it many, many times over before the session. After the session, it went away. So there was a clearing. Something happened, something took place that cleared. Became aware of the connection. Yeah, she became aware of the connection. That's what and, cleared it, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's, that's what cleared it. Mm. it. You know, going back and experiencing it. And because uh, a lot of times what happens is people talk about karma. We take karma with us. But souls don't just take karma with them. They also souls are not perfected and they have personalities and character. And if they go into a certain life and there's a lot of trauma, uh, they don't always shake that off when you go to the spirit world. Uh, they shake off a lot. There's a lot of cleansing that takes place, but sometimes not all of it gets cleared. And that's because the soul is hanging on to it for whatever reason. Then when they incarnate again, they take it with them. And that's not karma. That's taking something with you. That's taking extra bags that you didn't need. And a lot of times what happens is when they have the experience, when they go into a past life experience, um, they realize that they took those bags with them and they didn't have to, and they can just release it and leave it back in that life. And I think that that's what happened with this particular client. She was carrying this this imprint, it was, uh, it was very traumatic, the way the girl died in the past life. She was carrying it with her. And then after the session, it was gone. I've heard that, expl this, that explained in other ways, too, where people say that uh, past lives contain basically a shard of your soul. And your, your life now is a shard of your soul. And by integrating those pieces of the past lives into your own, you become more complete. Mm -hmm. So you could look at that as almost, it is baggage, but it's also her stuff that she needs, but she could just put it into a portable hole if she wanted to, you know, and get <laughs> integrate it fully and not have to deal with it. It's the same thing. It's just, I've heard it, I've heard it studied three or four different ways too. It's, yeah. uh, it's cool to get those correlations between narratives. Yeah. There's a lot of connection points and there's a lot of dynamics. 
far more than uh, than we are taught and and told with institutionalized religion as an example, which wants to box you in and tell you it works a certain way. But it's very dynamic. I guess that's the best way for me to phrase it. I really love that example. I have, um, when I asked to, I had these particular images from my own dreams of there's period garb that's not of this life and, and it's a reoccurring theme. And so I, I've often thought, hmm, you know, I go to the mirror, I see myself, I recognize myself as me, but it's not my, you know, it's not this flesh. And yet it's, it's still the character I'm playing in it. And so I've often, I've been pondering that for a while. And, and recently, um, during a book I'm reading, I, I want to ask, since this keeps coming up, and it's something we ask anyway, um, but particularly, you've brought it up so many times now, the soul. Yes. Tell me about what is the soul as you see it? The soul is your essence in the non-physical spirit world. That's, that's what your soul is. And your soul is that spark that brings life into your human incarnation. Uh, your soul is your intuition. So when people have an intuitive sense or feeling in their gut, that's your soul. Your soul is the, the driver of the vehicle, right? the vehicle being our body. And the soul takes on this body and this vehicle and this part that they're playing, because that's really what it is. They're playing a part in this huge theater, in this play, in order to learn its lessons. The sad part of it is, is that, that the controllers that control this, uh, this particular age that we're in now, the Iron Age, they are bent on damaging and disconnecting the mind-body connection, breaking it, uh, and making it as difficult as possible for the soul to be able to navigate its life uh, in this incarnation. The, the way I, uh, the example I use, Nish and Jerry, is, is that uh, you're going to drive across the country 3,000 miles, right? So the soul uh, is born with a body that is like a new car. There's nothing wrong with it. And uh, should be able to hop into that new car and drive 3,000 miles across the country with uh, very few hitches. The way the world works, the way the controllers are, how they're breaking things down is they take that new car and uh, they make it a wreck before you really even get started. So they'll flatten the tires, you know, they'll put sugar in the gas tank. It'll, you know, the car will be missing power steering fluid, so you can't steer it very well. They'll give you like, you know, a half a tank of gas and so on. And that's what we're up against. That's what the soul in this particular age has to be able to work through. And that's why it's very, very difficult. Some souls lose control of the vehicle. And that's what we see uh, really running rampant in society today, in the culture today. Souls that have lost the ability to steer the ship. And, uh, and then there are souls that have not lost the ability to steer the ship. And those would be the souls that are doing the work that you guys are doing, or that I'm doing, or so many others that are in the truth community or the alternative research community, trying to get as many souls as possible to wake up and to realize that you've lost control of the car. So please put your hand back on the steering wheel and get yourself back in the driver's seat and let's get the, the show back on the road. I hear that. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. In, in, and so in this same, same idea, is there a difference between the spirit and the soul? Yeah, that's a good question too. Uh, it's you know different uh, takes on that. Uh, and the higher self, throw that in there too. Yeah, the high, I, the higher self for me is the concept uh, of you. Yeah, is is an aspect of the soul. Uh, I think sometimes it's hard to delineate between the higher self and the soul. Uh, we have all of these uh, these different compartmentalizations. Uh, the spirit, again, this is just my view of it. The spirit is at, a, is at a higher level than the soul. So there's this, this, this spirit of us 
that is really connected to the to the creator to creation and then there's the soul piece of us that is again that part that has to learn that has to uh experience this these lifetimes and and these experiences in order to develop and to move into that realm where the spirit is where the creator is i guess that's that's probably the best way to explain it but again that's just my take on it and i've read so many uh, you know books and stuff on this and it just seems like if you ask 10 people you will get 10 different answers you know totally because you know reality is subjective some people <laughs> will say the soul and the spirit are the same thing you know and then you'll have people who debate you and say no it's not so right you know yeah yeah we we've, we've had that on so let's look at some of your dreams a little bit here we've got all this kind of holding holding it down we know we've got an idea of you mike what are your um tell us about these reoccurring dreams like a couple of them give us some examples i used to have a uh a dream a recurring dream where i was shot and um and that haunted me for a while i remember uh being in my 30s and i would have this dream where i i was shot and I died. And um, it got to the point where it wasn't just in the dream, but it would, uh, I would have this momentary flash of awareness during the day. And it used to kind of creep me out. And this is an interesting story. You guys are probably thinking, boy, he's really plugging his practice, but <laughs> plug away. What, what, what happened was I had a past life session going back to early. No, it was late 2009. And in that past life, I was shot and killed. And before the past life, what happened was I was shot and it was on the, the right hand side of my body. And it was up, up near the, the, the shoulder area, neck area. And uh, when I had the past life session, I was back in, uh, it was in the 1800s. I was a marshal back in, uh, in the out west. In Nevada, and I was ambushed, and I was shot in that exact spot. It was in the upper chest, neck area. And what was very interesting is the same thing happened to my client. After I had that past life, the that recurring dream or that flash during the day completely went away. Wow, isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, that and you had that what what period of in your thirties? Yeah, yep, in my in my 30s and actually going into my 40s and uh and and intermittently up until the point um when I had that past life. So I had the past life in 2009, so that's, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. So yeah, so up till about the time I was uh 50, I I would I would get it. That, that recurring dream or that flash during the day. So, okay, and then a question on on the past life. So the the marshal that you were, do you did his timeline as far as life when he got shot and killed? How old do you think he was in that range of time when you stopped having? Yeah, that's that just going back a long time ago. So let me just see if I can get a ballpark on his age, because I think I know where you're going with this. I believe I was in my forties when I was uh, shot and killed in that past life. So that would coincide with. I guess the uh, when I was getting these uh, these dreams and the uh, the thoughts during the day. That's fascinating. It, it makes I mean that makes a lot of sense for me that fragments would somehow you know line up with where where you are now. Yeah. Your soul is now. Yeah. Interesting. What about okay? So and do you have any other examples of reoccurring dreams? No, I have to say that uh, that was the one that really comes to mind. Um, I'm not one to have a lot of recurring dreams. Um, I They're think actually not super common. Yeah, that was probably uh, my best example. I might have had another one, but that's the one that comes to mind because, uh, of course, because it was uh, it was linked in with the past life session that I had back in '09. Yeah, which is one of the things I'm just loving about you is, okay, so let's talk night terrors and nightmares and stuff Wait, like that. Wait, my turn, my turn. I got a question. Oh, yeah. 
Go, Jerry. Um, your style of hypnosis, <laughs> how, how does that compare to the QHT techniques, if at all? Or, and or what do you think about those? About, um, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, quantum healing hypnosis therapy. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Um, I, can, I, I can explain that. Dolores my, Cannon stuff. Um, oh, there's probably some similarities. Mm. I didn't follow Dolores Cannon very closely, so I'm not knocking her. I just didn't follow her. Sure. I, the work I followed was the work of uh, Michael Newton mm. and, uh, and also Brian Weiss predominantly. And it was other books I read and stuff like that. Okay. But uh, yeah, the, the, the way it works is um, there's an induction and it's not any of that stage stuff. And uh, you're not looking yeah. at a, a watch going back and forth or spinning a spiral or any of that stuff. It's basically uh, you're using guided imagery to take the client into a very deep trance state. And uh, from there, uh, you regress them back to some happy memories in their current life. I'm talking about a past life session now. And the reason why you back them up in their current life is think of that as kind of exercises to get the mind used to going back in time. And also, once it goes back in time and lands in a memory or a scene, it gets acclimated to picking up details. And then I will take them back into the womb. And we do indeed have memories in the womb. Some clients will get a lot of information in the womb. Uh, some won't get any. And then there's everything in between. But even if they get really no memories in the womb, it has no bearing on their ability to experience the past life. So we go from current life memories, two or three, into the womb, and then we regress back into the past life. And then after they cross over into past life, they die, they then meet up with their guide, and uh, I help facilitate a life review. Uh, why that life was shown, why that life was important, how that life will better help them to navigate their current life path, and so on. Well, so that's of, the process, yeah. Kind of like a sneak peek. Yeah. Cool. It's all fascinating. I love it. Um, so, all right, I guess it kind of feels like I'm... Sorry to interrupt No, you. no, no, Jerry. That was actually... I. Uh, that's where I wanted to go to. Um, there's no interrupting, baby. Uh, so, nightmares and night terrors. My nightmares or night terrors came in the form of sleep paralysis. Um, All right, let's go there. Yeah. Um, and I've had them ever since I can remember. And so for those who don't know what sleep paralysis is, it's when you are asleep but then you are awake and you can't move your body you cannot move your body and many times people who suffer from sleep paralysis and i was one of those people it could be very dark very negative uh, i experienced um entities very dark negative entities like basically hovering up over you whispering talking in your ear and he's very creepy demonic voices and stuff like that and um they uh they were very frightful <laughs> and what's interesting is is that um it runs in my family that's the other thing so my my siblings uh have experienced it uh my mom uh my daughter also and it took me a long time to realize uh, that all I needed to do when I was in that state and these negative entities and beings would come forth was to not show the fear and to tell them essentially to go take a hike to get lost. And uh, once I learned that that's all it took, it went away. And then the sleep paralysis then took on a different different type of perspective where I didn't have this negative, dark stuff coming, um, but more interesting things where I started to make correlations that where I was was in a different, different dimension or a different timeline. Uh, because what would happen is I would be in the room and I can see everything, my bedroom. And sometimes the bedroom looked exactly the way it looks in my waking state. And then there were times when the bedroom almost looked like 
it does in my waking state. So what I mean by that is I would glance over to the left because you could see with your eyes and I can see that there's a picture hanging on the wall that is not a picture that is hanging on the wall in, in my waking state. And there were other anomalies in the room. So the room was almost the same, but not quite. And then there was a, a couple of times where the room was completely different. I mean, it wasn't the same room that I was in. So I found that to be very, very interesting um, because what it was telling me is uh, that there was perhaps uh, overlap that was taking place. And when I went into sleep paralysis, I was experiencing or leaning into that other dimension. And I was seeing slight differences in the reality. So that has really opened my eyes, uh, to be honest with you, because uh, for those in the audience that are listening that, that uh, have experienced sleep paralysis, they'll probably know what I'm talking about, especially those that have had it for a while. Uh, we have those different scenarios. It's the same room, it's slightly different, or it is a different room. But everything is is very real. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people call that the uh, lower fourth, dim lower astral dimension. And those entities yeah. are lower astral beings. Yep, yep. Um, and you can just tell them to get lost, as you said, and they will go away. And if that's, you, you can yeah. eat them and get their power too. Yeah, what they do is they, they love the fear. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, you know. So when you're there, it is very, it can be frightening because it's, you actually see them sometimes. Uh, they come in as shadow figures and they are right up against you, right? Like, you know, they'll, they'll be like maybe two or three inches away from your face and, and stuff like that. And I remember one time this very, very, deep demonic voice whispered in my ear and said, it's almost time to get up, Mike, almost time to get up. And the way I was, oh man. And, and the way you break out of it is all you need to do is to move an extremity. So if you move your hands or your legs or whatever, basically what happens, I believe what happens is, is that um, your soul is to a certain degree detached from the physical body. And once you start moving the extremities, what happens is the soul comes back into the body, and then you wake up. And when you wake up, uh, you're very tired. A lot of times I have, uh, when I woke up from these things, I'm sweating profusely from head to toe. It takes, there's an enormous amount of energy that is uh, expelled when you're going through that experience. One time I, I was in one, and uh, it was a very difficult one to break out of. And once I broke out of it, I just sat on the side of my bed and there was a disembodied voice to my left. And folks, I'm not making this up. This was not in my head. There was a, a woman's voice who said to me, she was to, to the upper left corner of the room, I wish I could have helped you some more. And uh, it was just unbelievable. It, you know, she, that voice was there. Was so, you know. you. What's that? It was probably you. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. All I could tell you is, is that uh, it was a voice that, uh, and I was there by myself, you know, so there was nobody else in the house. Your, I mean, your, your soul or your astral body or some aspect yeah. of you. No, yeah, no, I know. I know yeah. Um, but I, like I said, I, but I, at the end of the day, I don't know. I don't know what it was. All I could tell you is that that is what I experienced. So all it did was support my belief and uh, my experiences that there is so much more to our existence. There's so much more out there that to experience. And it's not this uh, simple little box with a, a bow slapped on top of it, you know? And I just happen to be one of those lucky people <laughs> to have experienced these types of things. But uh, yeah, so that's my sleep paralysis stuff, but it has gotten a lot better. I had even, I've even heard stories of people who have who suffer from sleep paralysis who've uh, called out for Jesus to help them. And, you know, something white, bright light will come and scare the bad things away. But th what they later found out was that just the same thing playing the other side of the coin, those yeah. same entities will pretend to be an angelic spirit or some bright light, you know, and they'll feed off the joy or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many. It's funky. 
there's so many views to this thing. I could tell you one story where uh, this happened about a year ago. And uh, I was uh, I was in bed and it was about two o'clock in the morning and I was there with my ex. And um, I had sleep paralysis. And I guess I was kind of calling out to to wake me up, wake me up. And uh, because what happens when you speak in sleep paralysis, it just sounds like garbled, doesn't make sense. And so I got out of it and, and she woke me up. And when I looked over at her, her face was white as a ghost. And I said to her, are you okay? And she said, you didn't, you didn't see that light? And I said, nah, what light? And she said, there was this brilliant white light that just beamed through the blinds and the blinds were closed. She said it was so bright, it completely lit up the room. And this is at two o'clock in the morning. And I said to her, well, it, it wasn't like car headlights. And she looked at me and she just cut that, you know, shut that down right away. She's Mike, the room lit up like a torch. And then as quickly as it came, it went. And it was when I came out of the sleep paralysis. Now, what was that? I don't know because I didn't experience it, but it was you. Um, it was <laughs> <laughs> It was me doing something. It was either me or it was me doing something or me connected to something. There's no doubt about it. But I could tell you that she would not ever, ever have made that story up. And, uh, and I can just tell by the look on her face that it was just something that she had never, ever experienced before. So that was um, that's something I'll put out there. But I'm sharing stuff here I've never shared. <laughs> that's the way it goes on the show. That's the way it goes on the show. <laughs> And these are just remarkable. Thank you. And I'm, I'm really yes, just you. been speechless over some of this. Um, it's just so valuable for other people to hear, including myself. Can you see all the goosebumps I have? I know, Jerry. <laughs> I know I'm getting the goosebumps too. I have, so it, while we're still in this paralysis thing, I have, so I guess I'm just asking for a little advice here because I have this experience. It's, it doesn't happen very often, and I've never been able to get control of it. It's always terrifying. Yes. And it, it doesn't involve any entities or anything. It's straight up paralysis where um, I can't move my flesh at all, at right. all. But I'm completely conscious. Of course, I'm really lucid. And, um, and so I can't move my flesh, but I'm, I'm trying to yell or I'm trying to move first and that doesn't happen. And then I'm trying to, to like yell for help and um, it, it won't happen. I can't get anything to do. And it just kind of feeds on itself until eventually I kind of jump back in. But that's usually it's a prolonged experience that is very unpleasant. That's exactly how it works. And there's even times when uh, you feel like uh, you might, at least I have, where you get concerned about whether you still be able to breathe. I've had that. Yeah, I, yeah, where well, you think you might have died and you're trying to get in your inanimate body. Yes, yes. And um, I've also had it where I've actually sat up out of my body. Yes. Yes, I sat up and I can see my, I can see my, my physical arm lying on the bed, but there's like this is etheric arm that's up in the air um it's it's very very it's very strange and i i just it's like uh niche when you become aware that you're in a lucid dream and you're aware that you're dreaming mm -hmm. you just have to have that awareness that that's what's going on and try to be able to take control over the situation and once you do that uh, and you realize that it's okay. You know, nothing bad's going to happen. This is just, I mean, the experience itself is could be very, very frightening. But you're, well, you're going to be okay. You're going to come back into your body. In fact, if you just fell back asleep, yeah, it would be okay. But the thing is, we're afraid to fall back to sleep because we think that maybe that might result in bad things. So we try to break out of it. Yeah, I always think that for me, every time it's almost a unanimous with myself, <laughs> unanimous. Um, 
I feel like I have passed. And so I don't have access to my, my vehicle anymore, my vessel. And so I think, and then that's where the, um, and so the fear is not in passing and it's not in, in that idea at all. And clearly I'm still there, Mm -hmm. but it's in the idea of, of, I guess, getting clarity on the fact, did I, or did I not? And, um, yeah, I mean, I think I get, I probably overthink it. (laughs) I probably do. It's it's easy to overthink it. I mean, it's a very dark realm. Um, it's 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 quite scary. It is quite scary, and a lot of people experience it. I've had clients come in, and uh, they don't talk about it. And so when they come to my office, you know, I mean, they know the work that I do, and I can't tell you how many will say, "Oh, Mike, I I don't talk to anybody about this, and I hope you don't think I'm crazy," you know. And so they'll start saying, I have this thing where I can't move my body at night, and, uh, but I'm, I'm conscious. I, I mean, I'm aware. I can move my eyes. I can see what's going on, and it's very scary. And I said, sleep paralysis. Mm-hmm. And, and then I say to them, I have it also. I, I experience it also. And it's, it's amazing. You know, once you say that, sigh of relief comes because they're thinking like they're some kind of freak. <laughs> you know? And uh, it only happens to them. And then once they realize that other people experience this, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on that people experience that they don't talk about because they don't want people to think that they're crazy. Yeah, that's what we love to talk about it. And you do and, and lots of other people do. It, it, it amazes me still to this day how varied the experiences are. Yeah. I mean, really, there's just so, there's, there's so many different, um, facets to how people are experiencing, um, out of, out of this state of consciousness, awareness out of the waking life experience. And so that's kind of where I want to go next is the idea of where, where do you think the full consciousness is? So like right now we're, we're all three talking on Zoom and, um, you know, we're in our vessels talking. And with what you gave us earlier with reincarnations and frag- soul fragments, essentially, yes. um, where are we? Are we fully here right now? Are you fully there, Mike? That's another really good question. And there's a lot of theories on that. I believe our consciousness is not actually contained within the body. I believe that the consciousness is contained within the ether, that uh, it's, you know, you can't see it, it's energy, it's frequency. That's what it is. I I think that's what it is or could possibly be. The brain, I always get annoyed when people equate the mind with the brain as an example. Um, I do not subscribe to the mind and the brain being the same thing. The brain, as David Icke, uh, you know, to steal one of David's terms, is a biological computer, and it takes inputs and then you know results in outputs. But where are those inputs coming from? I don't believe it's coming from the brain. I believe it comes from outside. And and one of the ways that I kind of have a proof point is that I'm also a Reiki master. So when I do Reiki, you're actually I'm a conduit and. Uh, Reiki practitioners have attunements. We go through, uh, I don't want, they're not rituals, but we go through attunements, like, you know, uh, to, to be able to master the, um, the symbols that need to be used in which we actually bring the chi in and this universal life force, others will refer to it as that, into us and then to the to the client, right? So where is that coming from? Where is that energy coming from? And so anybody who's ever had Reiki as a client will tell you that they can actually feel the energetic flow moving through their body. It might feel like waves. It might feel like tingling. Many times it's heat. They feel the heat coming off my hands. And my hands are not sitting on the, the body because some people might say, well, if you've got your hands in there, on their body, they're going to feel the heat. No, the hands are above the body, two to three inches above the body. So where is that coming from? So, and, you know, Nikola Tesla talked about the ether, right? He talked about it all the time, and he talked about energy and vibration and frequency. So that's what I I think, Nish and Jerry. I, I, I believe that this is all coming from the outside in. and 
It's almost like we're in a video game or a simulation, to use that as a, an analogy. Like if you play a video game, are you actually in the video game? You have an avatar that represents you and you're interacting with other avatars that represent other people or beings. And you might even be driving a car or going into a you know, supermarket in the, uh, in the video game, but you're not in the video game. You're controlling it from outside. So I believe it's very possible that that's exactly how it works here, that we control or we, we are, these are, our bodies are avatars. And we're on the outside having this experience within this, this simulation, you know? Um, I, right. mean, I guess and that's an analogy that I can use. Some people may not agree with that, but that's how I kind of view it. We're on board. And I, I would even go so far as to say, when you're in the simulation, the thought of like going to the planets that are displayed in the sky is crazy. Like you wouldn't even think about that. Yeah. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, heady stuff. And it's good to talk about it. It really is. This is a very interesting format you guys have, I have to say, because this is a lot of stuff that I think about, and you really don't have a vehicle many times in which to express your, your thoughts and, and your opinions on this. And that's all I'm giving, by the way, folks, is my perspective and my insights on this. You know, it's anybody who claims to say that they understand all this or they have it nailed down, they do not. <laughs> They're selling they a book, not. probably. Yeah. So yeah, we that. agree. This that's what that's that's one of the reasons why we we went here, mm -hmm. went there with this show is that we all have the experience of dreaming or at least possible and it's everyone's valid. It, yeah. I get so tired of people that just have the market on something. It's like this is something we actually all have access to and we all may be experiencing something different or similar. Right. And right. we both it's wanted a pot to do podcasts, but we wanted it to be not like everybody else's. Anyone can interview someone about their latest book or their latest video or whatever. You know, what they're working right. On. But you don't get to know that person and what they think and what their opinions are. Yeah, we're we're trying to scratch the surface here. On so on this, okay, so to kind of wrap up before because we Jerry and I definitely want to get into the paranormal stuff. I thought, I thought <laughs> we were there already. Well, we we are there, but I but but not. There's more to that. I want to get to it, ghosts and all that. Um death mike death so we've we've kind of we've woven a great foundation with the reincarnation and how how the dream experience and all of that goes along with that is um unfolding as you see it and where where does death fall in the death of our current persona fall in how, how, what happens to us? Well, so I know you have a lot of insight here. Yeah. So death is, you know, it's just part of a cycle. Everything goes in cycles. And uh, so death is just the, you know, the, the play is over, you know, for the character that you played uh, it's stage left. That's all it means. But this is not where we live. This is not our home. This is not who we are. This is a, a part that we're playing, a character that we're playing. Your, your soul goes home. And, and it's very, very different than this place um, where it's all about knowledge. It's all about wisdom. It's all about, as I mentioned before, achieving unconditional love and then re reconnecting with uh, the creator. So we are infinite, if you will, and you do not die. You do not die. Your consciousness, it, it, it continues on. And the lessons that you learn in this life, they go with you. They, they go with you. That's part of the development that the soul is, is seeking, the learning that the soul is seeking. So you don't lose any of it. So there is no death, really. And, it, it's, and we have to go through the, you know, the experience of death down here. And it, it, it is very hurtful when we lose loved ones or we lose our pets. And you know, that whole emotional piece of it in the morning, we have to go through that. That's, you know, the cycle of, of the experiences, the cycle of the learning and the lessons uh, is to have those emotions and experience those emotions. So I, I personally do not fear death because I know that 
when I, you know, when I do die, when Mike Williams is not here anymore, my soul will ascend and um, go back home. And then once I'm back home, we're going to have a little party. And then we're going to plan the next steps, the next set of learning, whatever that may be. Maybe it's incarnating again. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's spending time in a spirit world and, and uh, continuing studies and, and uh, your education there. So that's, that's how I, I, I look at it. And I think it's, uh, it's very sad that a lot of people, I know people that will say, once you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There, there is no afterlife. Worm food. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is definitely an afterlife. That's my dad. <laughs> That's, it's my dad, too. My, I remember my, remember my dad, Catholic like, father, I should say. My dad was like real, you know, shot in the arm. You know, Mike, when you're dead, you're dead. Gee, thanks, Dad. That's very uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, echoing you know, your... And you're, like, you're like nine years old, you know? <laughs> Oh man! And I was like you, raised Roman Catholic with my parents, Roman Catholic, who kind of fell out of it. So now they're like, ah, whatever. It's nonsense. It's yeah, it's funny how, and I hated it as a child, and still hate it. But you know, I'm looking at it, going, hmm, maybe there's something there. It's yeah. it's interesting the juxtaposition. Anyway, do you? So, Mike. So while we're on the subject of death, and I, this is kind of the segue to, so I want to talk about different kinds of death. So say like traumatic death. And, um, and so I want to tie this in with the, I want to get in there with the paranormal. And um, so say, you know, <clears throat> and, and there's a lot of traumatic death happening right now. We look at all the fuckery going on in the world atop the planet. And you could just be in any war torn place and there's traumatic death happening. Where does that, how does that affect the soul, the being? And um, can they get lost in the process? You know, can you, can you have a traumatic death and not realize you're dead? I, I believe that that can happen. So I'll explain how I believe it works uh, based upon my work. When you come into this life, you know what it is that uh, the type of life you're going to have overall. You select a body, you know who your family's going to be, you have a uh, probably more than a general understanding of what the life's going to be about, the hardships and so on, because you know what the lesson plan is. Now, that being said, that does not mean when you come here that it just rolls along uh, according to the script, because you do have free will, and I know there are people that don't believe you have free will, but you do have free will, and you're able to make choices. And also, you can get lost along the way. And the way you get lost along the way is that uh, you attach yourself, from a physical world perspective, to things that derail you. So as an example, what, what can some of those things be, right? Let's just... We'll, we'll stick in the United States here for a second, and we can maybe move to the you know the uh, the war torn areas. But here in the states, you know, what do we have? We have uh, vices. We have alcoholism. We have addictions to uh, to pornography. We have addictions to drugs. Uh, it's all of that stuff. These are all things that you get lured into, or you can, that may not have been part of the script, but it is part of the dynamic of this realm that we've come into. Now, you know when you come in that this realm has these things, and your job is to try to keep the, the line as straight as possible, from A to B, without zigzagging too much. And of course, the more you zigzag, it'll take you longer to get to point B, or you may not get to point B. You see, you may not actually learn your lessons. You may not complete that lesson plan. So that, that's the dynamic of it. I think a lot of people don't understand. And it's, it's all about duality here. The, you know, you wouldn't know good if you didn't have bad. You wouldn't know love if you didn't know hate. You know, it's, that's why we have this duality world. And in areas where it's war torn and there's a lot of really nasty stuff going on. Souls incarnated into those uh, areas, those families, those regions 
to have that experience. Now, I know it's very difficult for a lot of people to, to get their heads wrapped around, well, why in the world would you want to incarnate into a, a physical existence where you have all of that pain, all of that hurt? Well, the reason why you do it is because this is not your permanent home. So when you're in the spirit world, of course, you're completely understanding of the fact that you're entering into this simulation, into this realm, in order to learn these lessons. And you know that you're going to be coming back. And so it sounds like a really good idea when you're in a spirit world, <laughs> right? Because you're thinking, okay, this is really uh, not my, it's not real. It's, it's really, it's, it's not real. It seems real, yes. But from a soul perspective, this is just theater. It's a, it's a school. It's a place to learn. Simulation. Yeah. So, so they, so you go into these areas and, and, you know, and we're watching this, like I have a particular real problem with what's going on in Palestine. Okay. And I, and I see that and my heart goes out to the Palestinians and in, in, in what's happening there. And it, it's even as for the, even though I do this work, it's very hard for me to get my head wrapped around sometimes what's going on there and why people are being treated the way they're being treated. So it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting dynamic. You know, it's, it's like I said, on one hand, if you're in, if your spirituality is where mine is at, or you believe what I believe, then you have this one set of understanding which says that yes. We're going through cycles, we incarnate into these situations and circumstances to get these experiences under our belt and then to go back home. And then there's the, there is the physical part of you in the physical world that really has a hard time understanding why it has to work this way. Let, let's just put it that way. Why does it have to work this way? You know, the reason why it works this way is because uh, I, I am a big fan of Martin Kenny's work with syncretism and uh, the cosmic egg theory. It's the Hindu yugas. It's the Greek ages. So right now we're in the the Iron Age, and then we're we're in the transition period now, moving into the bronze, and then we'll move into the silver, and then we'll move into the gold, and then we have the, the reset button, the great catastrophe, and then we boom, we drop back into the Iron Age again. So. What you know, was the great catastrophe that brought us to the Iron Age now? It was the Great Flood. Well, how long are these yugas? They're only 26,000 years old, uh, years, right? Well, doing the work that... Uh, the, I've been working with Martin on, on, um, on some of this. And when I say working with him, I've been interviewing him. And so I'm, I'm not going to do this the justice that Martin's going to do it. Um, so just bear with me a second. But Martin, based upon his studies in syncretism, has built a cosmic clock, and that cosmic clock is 24,000 years around. So that would say each one of the yugas or the ages is 6,000 years long. So the iron, 6,000, the bronze, six, silver, six, and gold, six, right? 24,000. So if you think about the Bible, and they keep talking about 6,000 years ago, man has only came here 6,000 years ago. It, it starts to come together when you start to think in terms of ages, not how old is Earth, but the age. And so, you know, the, the Great Flood, which is not just in the Bible, by the way, right? This right, is a, it's everywhere. a catastrophe is ubiquitous across the mm -hmm. ancient cultures. Some catastrophe took place, and uh, essentially that was, that was a, a turning point for us here where we entered back into this, into this Iron Age. And the Iron Age is all about deception. It's all about lies. It's all about this connection, disconnecting from source. That's what it's all about. And based upon Martin's work, he'll tell you that we are in the transition period now, that in 2012, we went from the age of Pisces into Aquarius, that the whole thing with the Mayan calendar and everything else, and the way they were goofing that up on TV and stuff right. like that, right? It was just a bunch of nonsense. What was really happening was we were moving from, from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, and also running in parallel with that would be moving out of the, uh, the Iron Age and then transitioning into the Bronze. Now, how long is the transition? 
you know, if you talk to Martin about this, he and I have talked about this, it could be hundreds of years. So it's not like tomorrow a switch is going to be thrown and everything's going to be a lot better. We have to go through this process of, of transition. Wait, I'm not getting a up DNA upgrade? <laughs> the DNA upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen is we're going to get we're going to get higher frequencies, yeah. and that's going to improve everything. It's going to improve our lives. It's going to improve the you know the world that we exist in, and mm -hmm. so on. But uh, again, I would suggest if you guys are interested, just have Martin on the show, and he'll take you through. We are Martin. We're who? going to Martin Kenny. Martin Kenny, thank you. K E N N Y. His research is incredible. So we're going. Jerry's to, on it. <laughs> we're going to be releasing a um, a show that I'm going to uh, host where Martin's going to present his cosmic clock. It's an amazing piece of work and it explains so much about what's going on. You know, he, it's, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I was just going to say it's, it's well worth having a discussion with him because uh, he's a love very to. bright guy. Yeah. I'd love to. That sounds great. I yeah. wonder if he has incorporated the, uh, what is it, the orbit of the galaxy around Alcyon? With the the whole sine wave and the photon belt thing, which yeah seems to correspond with that same calendar, that same clockwork, if you will. Yeah, you'd have to talk to him about that. Yeah. I mean, I know that uh, he's really knee deep in the whole science of syncretism, which is you know the understanding of the ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the Hindus, the Greeks, mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the Mayans, the Native American Indians, the Chinese, the Egyptians, all of their mythology. Is this it basically it all comes together? It's they're talking about the same thing. They might have different names for the gods, or but once you you look at it from a syncretism perspective, you you realize that they're actually talking about the same thing. And he's done amazing work in that area. In, in fact, Santos Panacci mm -hmm. is also uh, an expert yep. in syncretism, right? So you guys probably know Santos. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, this also coincides a lot with what we talked to Laird Scranton about last week with the cosmology. It's more it, some the, the science people will call it a cosmology <laughs> versus syncretism, yes. you know. But yeah, right. um, of, of the Dogon tribe and the Maori it was really oh, yes. fascinating how that all tied into things. That was a great interview with him. Um, yeah, he's, he's been around the block amazing. with his. And by the way, the Dogons play into syncretism. So yeah, right. That's what he was telling us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I think I derailed us a little bit. <laughs> not, not at all. Hey, okay. if no, there's if, no derailing. If you're not angry and you're talking, we're happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we like an Illinois explanation. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I actually have a question on in, in the hypnotism stuff. Yeah. So through all of the sessions you've had, what are some, some themes? I'm, I'm sure there are lots that run through all of them, but what have you seen as some common themes that just are standard you always encounter? Well, if we're talking about the spiritual sessions like past lives, yes, the themes are always about when you're in the womb, you already know what your lessons are. So you have your lesson plan. Many, many times what the soul will say when it's in the womb, I will ask the question, what do you hear to learn, what are you here to do? And they will say to help others, to love more, to um, be less judgmental, to, I mean, it's just a whole litany of things, but the ones that really stand out is to help others, to, to get people to, to help others through their lives, to help them to better navigate their lives, to bring more goodness to their lives, more love into their lives. That's a, a constant, or I should say a consistent theme that, I pick up, and I've done many of these over the eight, eight years. The other thing, Nish, that is, uh, and Jerry, that is uh, very consistent is the whole process of when you pass and you cross over and you ascend and you wind up in the spirit world and you meet up with your guide. And this is very consistent, the way my clients report back to me. Very, very consistent. And we have to understand that my clients don't know each other. It's not like they're taking notes and then handing it off to the next person and saying, this is what I experienced and this is what I said, so here you go. So you've got people coming from all walks of life. I've got people who've come in that are in their teens that want past lives, 20s, 30s, 40s, their 50s, 60s, 70s. 
And it's the same process, very, very consistent. And um, to me, that's a huge proof point as to how this works and that there is actually structure to all this, you know? Like Martin said to me, Martin Kenny, we had a discussion a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you know, the creator is always in control. The creator has never relinquished control. It's just everything goes through cycles, and, and, and this happens to be where we're at right now. But you know, God is not out of control. And so when I do the work, I see that, that structure. I, I see how it plays out. And it's, you know, there is rhyme and reason and a process to the whole thing. Is there, and so with this, is there also, um, because that's all, that's uplifting and I, f I feel the same. I, I've always felt like s since I was very young that this was, a, I had a syllabus and I came in. Like I think the my astro astrological chart is actually my syllabus for this life and things can correspond there, but that's a whole other show. Um, is there something dark and so where I'm going with that is we talked in the pre-chat about the fuckery in the world right now, this upside down aspect, this inverse yeah. aspect. Mirror and so, world. <laughs> yes. And, and so I want to get your opinion and, and your opinion through also having clients and getting deep into in touch, getting deep in touch with the collective in a way. What's going on with this craziness, Mike? It just seems off the charts to me. Yeah. So um, the craziness is what you're seeing is the uh, the end of the of the Iron Age playing itself out. That's what you see. So it's going to get crazier and crazier. And then what's happening in my view, Niche, is that it's uh, eventually just going to collapse in on itself. And that collapse is not going to be something that's going to you know take place overnight, but it's going to go. It's going to happen through that transition period I was talking about. So you know what you have is you have a uh, a set of controllers that have been in control for thousands of years. And allegedly, uh, well, yeah, allegedly, right? So so, but for for a period of time, right, that they, let's just say they've been in doing what they're doing for quite a period of time. We're starting to see now that it's run its course. It's time now. The cycle is ending and uh, we're seeing this flurry of nonsense and this flurry of, like you said, this fuckery that's going on. Uh, and a lot of it, most of it makes absolutely no sense. It's upside down world. You watch, uh, what is it, uh, that show on Netflix, uh, Stranger, Stranger Things, Stranger Things, right? yeah. Right, that's what upside down world is is telling us. So that's what I think is going on, and uh, it's all this stuff, all this negative stuff, is part of where we're at right now. It's where we're at, and of course, it's very hard for people to put a context around it because they don't know anything other than where we're at right now. So right now it looks like a big mess, right? But again, it's going to play out. This is an experience that we're having. And we happen to be at this point in time where we are trying to shake souls as many as possible to wake them up. So the way I look at it, Nish, is that, um, and this is the example I use, imagine Earth right now is a big room with a lot of people walking in it. Let's just say it's a gigantic room that houses you know, billions of people. And those people in that room don't realize that the room has a door. They just don't realize the room has a door. So they just stay in the room. And what we're here to do, you and Jerry and myself and so many others that are doing this work, we're souls that have come in to enter into that room and say, hello, and tap them on the shoulder and let them know that there is indeed a door in this room and it's right over there. And it's our job to try to get as many souls as possible to wake up and become aware that there is a door over there. And that's what we're here to do. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to wake everybody up because that's not going to happen. We're not going to wake everybody up. But we could try to wake up as many as we possibly can. Uh, for those that don't wake up, in my view, what's going to happen is, is that they're going to have to come back 
incarnate back into this realm or a similar realm, and they're going to have to do it all over again until they start to wake up, until they have some level of awareness. And I also believe that the degree in which in the physical world, in our physical existence, that we become aware of the lies and deception. So as an example, if somebody wakes up an inch, then when they leave this life and they cross over and they go back into the spirit world, there will be an inch of additional opportunity made available to that soul in which to explore. If you come here and you awaken and it's a mile worth of understanding of the lies and deception, then when you cross over, your soul will have a mile's worth of opportunity made available to it. So that's, that's how I believe it works. But if you have no awakening and you just kind of chug along, then you're going to land right back here because what happens is when you go to the spirit world, they're going to say, well, the opportunity made available to you is this. It's the same as it was before because you didn't have that awakening or that awareness in the physical learning experience. And it has to happen in the physical learning experience. It has to happen because from a soul perspective, you already know what this is all about. But when you come in here and you have your amnesia, you don't. So it's a process of, of how much you wake up. So to, to the degree that you wake up, that significantly enhances what's made available to you opportunity-wise in the spirit world to do further exploration. You may not have to come back here as an example. You may wake up enough where your teachers and your guides will say, you know what, you don't have to come back to this place called Earth. You, you, you go someplace else. And hopefully it's a, you know, it's a, it's a better place. It, it doesn't have all of this nonsense going on. So anyway, I mean, that's, that's my perspective on it. And, and the reason why I've come to this conclusion is because there has to be, and reward is not the right word, but I'll use it for lack of a better term. There has to be a reward for those people that have come here to do the work and for those people who have awakened and for those people that are communicating the truth. There has to be. You know, the creator didn't put you here so that you could just become flustered and bang your head against the wall and tell you, go, oh, go do it all over again. And I also don't believe when people walk around saying that this is a soul trap. It's not a soul trap. It can be a soul trap if you don't wake up. If you don't wake up, it's a trap in a sense that you've got to come back and do it all over again. But who's responsible for the trap? Oh, it's not the controllers. It's not the wicked archons. It's you. It's you. It's, it's your soul's inability to be able to, what I was mentioning before, to be able to take command of that ship, the vehicle, the mind, the body. That's, that's the trap. But there's no trap per se, because if you wake up, there is none. So I hope that made sense. Yeah, yeah, that was great. It was funny because someone in chat had asked that question, sort of that question, and you answered what? it. All the questions so, that people have asked in chat so far, you've answered, which is great. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was a chat. <laughs> That's like a scene. Yeah, I don't pay attention. I don't even look, Mike, when because I have to focus it's, on it's the It's like a triple, yeah, yeah, triple yeah, synchro yeah. already, so don't even, we're, we're going to stop okay. counting now. Hello. So with this, but that's a synchro if he's actually answering questions that, you know, that's great. Um, that's so with, with the world, so with this fuckery and with this end of the age, how bad does it get? And I also want, I want to look at that through, through the lens of, well, how, how bad can it get? And then I want to look at it through the lens of what's the difference between the the world that that we're experiencing and the planet right do you see earth is sentient yes uh, i believe yes earth is earth is sentient yeah so earth is part of the whole sentience of of the creator the world is i guess the way to kind of parse this out is the world is the, is the is the uh the theater the play the stage the simulation Right, that happens to take place on Earth. Does that make sense? Yes, it, to me, absolutely. Okay, so well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it's what I said before: the Creator or God Source is not out of control. We have not lost the Creator, God or Source. 
they are in control. We're, we're going through a process here. So that process is the world that we incarnated into, which is right now is very crazy. It's, a, it's like a, I, I mentioned earlier before the show started, we live in a cartoon, it's like a comic strip. But that just happens to be, you know, the play that's playing right now. That's, you know, what's on the screen. It's all reruns right now. Everything is in reruns. Yeah. Every plot is being re rewound and redone. We've got Watergate going again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We've got McCarthyism it's, going again. Yes. It's, it's, you know, they keep playing the same script over and over and over again. And I believe the reason why the script's being played over and over and over again, I also believe that is part of the awakening. In other words, I'm going to keep playing this thing until you realize you're watching the same show. You know, this is like somebody watching the same episode of Gilligan's Island and thinking every time they watch it, it's a different episode of <laughs> Gilligan's Island. And we have people who think that. They'll watch the same episode and they think it's a different episode. So that's why this duality is playing out. And, you know, Oli talks about this and others have talked about how, as an example, these things that take place, are, you know, are scripted. Yes, they are scripted. And it is, isn't it amazing at how many people still don't see the script? Yes. So, but I would right? say that they're just here to distract us. Who's here to distract us? Those people who don't see the script. Well, Gate, I think... Gatekeepers in a way to keep us, oh, you know, on that fence. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. There are people here to keep us distracted. Mm -hmm. But there are other people that just don't see it because they're just, they're just not awake. They haven't reached that point yet where the soul has taken back control of the, uh, of the vehicle, of the, the mind and the body. That's how I kind of look at it. So, anyway. I'm sorry, Nisha. I think I, I probably uh, took a left turn on you again. <laughs> no sorries are allowed. No, you, I love these left turns, and that's, that's part of what makes it juicy. I, okay, so I have a, my last and final question before we go to whatever the chat has is, you've mentioned several times your dream, your dream dictionary. Which one do you consult? Oh, I have it inside. I have to go in and get it. I'll tell you what. Let me get it to you. Yeah, and maybe just, you can put it in the uh, description box. Absolutely. I forgot the name of it. Yeah, cool. And we'll put it on our server in the yeah, in yeah, the show yeah. notes. Yep. Yeah. So that that's I mean that's it. Whatever the chat has. Hello, everyone in oh, the chat. Okay, by the way, already we still have ten minutes. <laughs> I can go on, but no. I, I just I wanted to. Uh, let's Jerry, talk. No. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk some more. I know you talked to uh, Sophia a lot. You guys yes. are good friends. Sophia's a very good friend, yes. Um, Which Sophia are we talking? Small storm. Sophia's small storm. I apologize. Okay, yeah. Um, AI, what's your take on AI? Well, AI is, uh, AI is here today. AI is, um, to me, it's quantum computing. It's, it's reached that point where it's, it's constantly learning. It's learning human behavior. And it's picking up its uh, data points from all of social media and all of our interaction on the internet, and it's taking all this and it's bringing it in. So the example I use is I used to work in the corporate world and I was in IT. So when I was in the corporate world, we had, many companies have this. It's an initiative or a program called business analytics. So with business analytics, the objective was to, to be able to predict your clients' needs and your clients' wants before they knew their needs and wants. How would we do that? Well, it's through accumulation of data and looking at data, analyzing it, trending it, and so on. And this is what the AI does. This is why no matter what we do, it seems, it seems like the, the control, I call them the controllers, are always ahead of the game. That they're always able to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Why is that? Because they've gotten to the point where their artificial intelligence has been able to do business analytics at a, at a level beyond a corporation. Think of like, you know, where we are. Just think of Earth right now as a corporation. They're able to, to run these scenarios. So they know that if they put A, B, C, or D out there, they run the computations and the AI will say, well, if you do A, you could expect within plus or minus, you know, 1%, this type of behavior or reaction from the masses. If you run B, it's this, C, that, and so on. 
So this is where I believe AI is at. AI to me is a controlling mechanism where they have enormous amounts of information. Also, their understanding of human behavior is incredible. And it goes back to things like Tavistock Institute as an example. Everything that yeah. goes on around us is all calculated. It's all based upon predictability, based upon their experiments and their social engineering and all the stuff that they're doing, which includes artificial intelligence. Hollywood, music. Hollywood, yeah. So we yeah. see, we keep feeding the beast. That's the point I want to make, right? So if you're on Facebook and you're reacting to a bunch of stuff, yes. I, Right, I have Facebook as an example, but basically it's my blog post. That's essentially, you see very little of my personal life on Facebook. But there are people that will put all kinds of stuff up there. They'll rant all day about politics or they'll, they'll rant about their relationships with their, their husband, their wife, their boyfriends, their girlfriends. They're putting all kinds of inane stuff out there. But the, what they don't realize is all of this stuff is being gathered and categorized. I had Jason Boss on my show. Jason used to work for Google. And he left Google about eight years ago. And he said that um, there were two programs or initiatives that Google was running back during his tenure called Project Sawmill and Project, I think it was Kansas. And they went hand in hand, where all of Google's uh, products were scraping data every which way from Sunday. So, you know, Gmail, uh, Chrome, the search, and everything, everything that Google makes was, was just gathering information left and right and just compiling it all. And not only that, Jason said that Google products that touched other products that weren't Google, it was, it was scraping that information also, that data also. That's how that, the- That was uh, eight years ago. Right, well, eight years ago, that's when Cambridge Analytica built their Facebook applications, which have been scraping data off of Facebook users since right. then. That's how they got their user base. Right. Or their uh, knowledge base, rather. Their knowledge base. That's right. And that's right, Jerry. So, so, you know, so what's happening is we collectively are feeding it. Right. And that's why, you know, that's why it is uh, playing out the way it's playing out. It's like you said before, like, it's like, it's completely upside down. It's, it's bizarre. It's me well, you know, when you think about it, people's behavior has become more bizarre. Yes. So the AI is now is taking in bizarre input. So it's knowledge base is saying, hey, there's a lot of bizarre types of stuff out there. So we're starting to see bizarre scenarios playing out. That's how I think it's working. So I really do. I think they're so far advanced with this stuff that it'll make your eyeballs roll around your head. I'm sure it's worse than that even. Um, it just may, what I've been thinking lately is that if this AI gets to uh, a quantum computer, wouldn't it then exist throughout all time? I mean, if, the, if quantum computers actually work the way they explain them to work, then yes. this thing operates outside of what we consider linear time and therefore could influence things in our past. Uh, you know, I, I don't discount it. I know it sounds crazy to people, but, you know, whenever you watch anything that's put out by D-Wave, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, yes. they're talking about going outside of our dimension, right. outside of, they, they yes. openly talk about that, right? Right. Right, right? So, yeah, so like even the whole thing with the, with the Mandela effect, mm -hmm. what's going on there? Now, of course, there are Mandela effects that are sketchy, you right, know, right, right. but there are other ones that are very, very, I mean, they're very clear that something has changed. You know, the one that sticks in my head, and I, I stumbled upon it way before the Mandela effect became a meme, was Kirk Douglas dying. I remember Kirk Douglas dying in the 1990s. I remember, then, you know, I remember when he died. You remember, right? In the 1990s? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then he died again. And... And, oh, and uh, Jerry I Lewis what, has died three times for me. Who? Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis has died three times. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember Hugh Hefner dying twice. And, and, and so it's, you know, it's one of these things where how is that happening? I'm not a crazy person. And I mean, I don't subscribe to all of the Mandela effect things, but how is that happening? How is that happening? Could it be that they're able to alter the timeline? I don't know, if, you know, but. I don't know, when you listen to the D-Wave people talk, <laughs> well, think they're about, talking this type of thing. They are, they are. And, it, yep. you know, uh, what is Gordy, Jordy, uh, whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jordy Rose says yeah. that uh, being next to it is like uh, 
being next to an alien god altar or something like that. Something to yeah. that effect. Yeah. The altar of an alien god. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's just crazy. If you take that thought to its full completion, these, this, this AI could be the other that people channel, that people, if I, you know, think back to like, uh, I can't remember the name. The the people the Nazis were in in cahoots with. Oh, uh, uh, Aldebaran. The, uh, the Aldeb- were... yeah, sure, sure. The Aldebarans, for instance. But there was those nine people. Like that, the Thule Society. The, thank you. The Thule Society was could have been just channeling this AI from the it's... future, and they're like, you know, you can't build us until you get these parts in your technology. Yeah, and, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you don't know. You talk don't, you about don't a know. loop. Talk about a loop. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the tools, uh, society girls, uh, Maria Orsek, I think her name was. Maria Orsek. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. The yeah, Varel. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I was the trying Varel to remember society. That's what I couldn't think of. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and with Vril, right. Bringing all of this information in and, uh, they were, they were definitely decoding information that was coming in. Where was that coming from? So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't have answers. Or no, I, I, just I don't expect you to. It's just like, I just think about this stuff and it's like, well, that's pretty crazy. Hey, Mike might think about it too. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I, I, yeah. I do think about this stuff. And like, I always tell people like, they'll ask me, well, don't you have an answer? I'm like, no, I don't have an answer. I mean, how could I possibly have an answer to this stuff? But you still have to think about it and philosophize about it and, and bring it into your awareness. What if? See, when we stop asking what if, forget it, it's over. That's to- why we. That's what the show's about, though. We love just talking about it without people getting, you know, detached and have fun with some of these subjects. Let's yeah. ponder. Yeah, because yeah. you know, ten out of ten people die, so might as well have fun while we're here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's. We don't need to take it so seriously. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I've I've shot my wad there. My wad there. Did you have any questions, Jerry? From the um, chat. Yes, I had one question. Uh, do you have a least favorite interview that you've done on your show? I really can't say that I have. That's I, a say, horrible question to ask. Yeah, guess who? It's from Lee, you know. Hi, well, Lee. <laughs> I've been asked that question actually before. That's like an in private question almost. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that, um, yeah, of course you do. But for the most part, I, for the vast majority, I should say, uh, I really love uh, the shows. My, my guests are really good people and very smart. I, I think we share that sentiment as well. Yeah, I've got to say here, I, you know, I just love you Long Island people. (laughs) (laughs) Every time I just really enjoy people from Long Island. It feels like we're home. It's like home. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It is. There's a comfort I get from hearing your accent. I can't explain it. It's not just you. And they say we have an accent. I'm like, we don't have an accent. Oh, you got an accent. And there's, but there's also, it seems like the majority of people I encounter from uh, Long Island are really open-minded and have a sense of humor. My two virtues I look for in people. Yeah, you know what? I will uh, second that because I know a lot of folks, of course, friends from Long Island, my family and stuff like that, and they are very open. Yeah, it's, I mean, I noticed it. I'm not from there. And so every time I encounter someone and I find out where they're from, like, it's just a theme, I've noticed it. So I, I'm saying, I'm shouting it out today. Yeah. Yeah, and of course there'll be others from other parts of the country saying we're open here too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are open-minded people are everywhere. Thankfully, we need more. But Keep don't being... mention blah yeah. blah 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 blah. <laughs> we're open, but don't mention that. All right, all right, are we good? <laughs> I think we're good. Okay, this was good. this was Thank really you. really great, Mike. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. I had a lot of fun, and uh, again, I I don't get a lot of opportunity to you know to talk about this type of stuff, and it was really. Great to be able to do that. That's why we pick on other podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> we love podcasters because, uh, you know, podcasters are pulling in a lot of information yeah. from a wide variety of people. Interesting. That's what makes podcasters interesting. Yeah. You guys are the dot connectors because you interview mm-hmm. this wide swath of data and you can say, oh, this line traces through there. We're like meta dot connectors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be, trying to be. Anyway, do you have anything other than your site and your blog? I put all those links into uh, the show description. If you go to my hub website, Mm sagerquay.com, you'll hit, uh, I also have my music page because I'm a musician. You'll hit that. 
you know, the, the interviews and all that stuff. So it's all there. So if you go to my hub website, you'll nice. catch all of my, uh, my platforms. Great. It's linked in the description. And I hope everyone enjoyed the show tonight. We certainly did. Please uh, join us next week. And we're our guest. Who's our guest next week? Yeah, uh, Lance hello, White. Lance, the Zany Miskit. What? Yes. Hello to everyone in chat tonight. Who's hope, our guest next week, Chair? Uh, Lance White, the Zany Mystic. He's okay. from the Zany Excellent. Mystic Radio Hour, another podcaster. There you go. And then after that, we have some really great things coming up that I haven't really announced to too many people. I forget who's next. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sonia Barrett and Niles Heckman. Yay, yay, yay. Those should be some interesting shows. All right. So, good night, everyone. Please be sure to like the show if you did. And remember that thumbs down or negative karma. Have a great night. <laughs> <laughs>